Great. So let's get started. Um, I also wanted part of my goal to be today uh, to hopefully convince some of our trainees about the importance of not just being a surgeon, uh, but also being a scientist. Um, I certainly myself can't imagine being a surgeon without being a scientist, and I can't imagine being a scientist without being a surgeon. So hopefully at the end of this, I will have convinced you of that. I will not discuss any off-label uses. So let's dive right in uh, and talk about the magnitude of the problem, which I think many people in this room are familiar with. Um, but this figure is looking at the incident and prevalent population of individuals in the United States uh, living with end-stage kidney disease. And you can see that it has grown in terms of prevalence. And currently in the US, there are over 700,000 individuals with end-stage kidney disease. That is a ton of people. We only have about 90,000 of those folks actually listed for transplant. Yet we know kidney transplantation is the gold standard, and that's really what this graphic here shows you. So if you look at the relative risk of death, once that line crosses one, uh, it actually means that there's a survival benefit. And I don't think I have ever seen a study done that did not demonstrate kidney transplantation to be associated with a significant survival benefit over remaining on dialysis, no matter what kind of kidney you use. Um, so if that's the case, why do we have 700,000 individuals with end-stage kidney disease and fewer than 100,000 actually currently listed for transplant? That's certainly a disparity right out of the gate. So we'll start by um, talking about how do you actually go about uh, accessing this wait list. So this is some great work done by a colleague, Rachel Patzer, out of Emory, where she looked at referral for transplant. So the first step is when you have kidney failure, you have to have your nephrologist actually refer you to a transplant center to be evaluated. And she looked at Dallas facilities in Georgia. And what she found was that uh, the median referral rate uh, that were of patients referred within a year was only about 24%. And when she looked at facilities in the lowest tertile of referral, meaning they referred fewer than 20% uh, of their patients, she saw that those centers had a higher likelihood of treating patients in high poverty neighborhoods. Um, they had a greater patient to social work ratio, and they also were much more likely to be a for-profit facility. And so here I'm showing you at the very outset that there's already a disparity in how patients go about accessing the waiting list and receiving this gold standard therapy for end-stage kidney disease, uh, kidney transplantation. So this has been recognized. I think one of the good things that did come out of the previous administration was incentivizing transplant over dialysis. So this was uh, an executive order on advancing American kidney health. And this really sort of uh, put a bullseye, if you will, and sort of said, you know, we need to do better. We need to make it our goal to get 80% of our kidney failure patients either on home, home dialysis or actually transplanted. Um, or at least on the waiting list by uh, calendar year 2025. And so this has really put the pressure on dialysis facilities to begin doing a better job of referring patients. So you think, wow, okay, well that's good. We've got a federal mandate. All dialysis patients are covered by Medicare. So this is good. There's checks and balances in the system. But beyond referral, you have to actually make the waiting list. So once you're referred, the transplant center has to look at everything and say, you know, is this patient really going to be a good candidate? So we wanted to look at that and sort of look through an incident adult in stage kidney disease population. And we looked at two years worth of data using USRDS data from 2012 to 2014. And so in those two years, there were about 217,000 incident dialysis patients. And we said, let's apply some standard criteria that most transplant centers use as reasons not to list a patient. So we eliminated patients who had active um, alcohol or substance abuse, uh, patients who had um, uh, active coronary disease that was severe, um, AIDS, um, severe liver disease, things like that. And then we also um, eliminated patients with poor functional status, so people out of a nursing home. Um, and or people who actually themselves declined transplant. And when we did that, we whittled down that incident population to about 157,000 patients. But again, I told you there are only 90,000 that are actually on the waiting list. So what actually excludes the majority of patients after that? And as it turns out, it's actually BMI. So weight is one of the largest drivers. Most transplant centers don't transplant patients with BMIs of over 40. So this graphic is looking at the cumulative incidence of weight listing by BMI category. And you can see that as the BMI increases, um, the bottom line is showing you with patients uh, with BMIs of 45 plus, the likelihood of being weight listed actually decreases substantially. 
And why is that? This is, is very interesting, and I think we need to better understand why that might be. And we actually were curious, were there actually other disparities? And so we looked at both sex and race. And what we found is that there are actually sex-based disparities within this. So if you look at the BMI group and you look at the uh, likelihood of weightlifting or the risk of weightlifting of women compared to men, you can see that for increasing BMI categories, when you compare men and women of the same BMI, women are much less likely to be weightlisted than their male counterparts. And so there's a gender disparity in weightlifting as it relates to weight. So if you're a man with a BMI, uh, a 45, you're much more likely to be waitlisted than a woman. In fact, a woman is 45% less likely to be listed uh, in that category. And why might that be? Well, it may be implicit bias. We don't know. We, no one's really studied that. When you look at a woman, uh, do you think that she is more fat? When you look at a man, does he get credit for being more muscular? And you say, well, the BMI is not a great reflection of his true size. We don't know that, but it is something that um, my colleague and one of my partners, uh, Dr. Salat Sheikh, who just joined us a year ago, uh, has an ongoing study to try to better understand uh, provider implicit bias in terms of how we sort of view a patient and whether or not that factors into our decisions regarding waitlisting. We also have to do something about the waitlist problem, if you will, and what role do bariatrics play? Um, and this is Dr. Arandi, one of our transplant surgeons, um, and he is interested in this and is now in a K award studying. Is there a role for bariatric surgery, both pre-transplant, perhaps we can actually reverse chronic kidney disease progression, um, or can we help patients who are already have end-stage kidney disease lose enough weight to actually qualify for transplant? And I think um, the pivot from uh, gastric bypass to sleeve gastrectomy opens this up significantly. Uh, we won't have as many issues with immunosuppression absorption uh, after sleeve gastrectomy. So he's studying that. So more to come there. Um, and I think this will be super important for women on the waiting list. But even if you are referred and you can actually access uh, the waiting list, uh, we do have a supply and demand problem. There has to be a kidney for you to actually be able to get a transplant. And without question, I think many of us in transplant sometimes feel like we're the deck chair rearrangement officer. Um, there just simply aren't enough organs to go around, and that's really what this graphic is showing you. You can see the demand far exceeds supply. And then on top of that, if we're talking about disparities, we really have to talk about equity. And how do you actually ensure equity in the context of a limited supply? How do you decide who gets what? Uh, and that becomes very challenging. I think I would argue that I think the first thing you have to do is actually have an accurate measure of end-stage kidney disease burden, right? So different people, different populations, different places have higher disease burden. And so they're gonna need a little bit more out of the gate uh, to solve the problem than places with lower disease burden. This is some work by one of our epidemiologists, Dr. Reed, um, where she looked at this. Um, and she actually was the first person to define essentially an end-stage kidney disease belt. And you can see there the dark colors means that we have a lot more end-stage kidney disease per million of our population. And it really sort of mimics the Gulf Coast states. So you're looking at Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. Um, and those actually follow, not surprisingly, uh, the stroke belt, as well as the obesity belt, the black belt. Um, and so not surprisingly, overlapping disease prevalence underscores the need to consider disease burden and organ supply and allocation. And I think you have to really have a handle on that to actually ensure equitable transplant access, as well as preventing future comorbidity. So disease burden does a couple of things. Number one, it impacts organ supply, right? So if you have tons of end-stage kidney disease and you're trying to, from that same population, find deceased donor kidneys, why well, can't transplant a kidney from a deceased donor that had kidney failure? That doesn't work very well. So again, some more elegant work done by Dr. Reed where she looked at this and she looked at Gulf State donor service areas um, and she looked at what the um, actual uh, expected kidney donation rate per 100 eligible deaths. Um, and if you see, if you control for nothing, we don't, ha we don't do very well. But once you actually control for the end-stage kidney disease burden and you look at model two and model five that have the best R squared, and both those models actually control for end-stage kidney disease burden, you can see that Gulf State DSAs actually perform pretty well in terms of identifying eligible kidney donors. So part of the reason we have fewer kidneys is because we have greater disease burden. And so that has to be taken into account when you're starting to think about allocation and other things.
We also know that disease burden impacts organ supply, particularly when it comes to living donation. So again, work done by Dr. Reed and our group, and she looked at this very thing. And she found that median rates of living kidney donation really varied across the United Network for Organ Sharing Regions from about 20 to 50%, depending on what region you live in, with the Southeast United States having the lowest living donation rate shown there in the dark purple uh, in the upper figure. And when she looked at this, this was really correlated with poor socioeconomic status or higher uh, SES index. And uh, this was associated with high prevalence of less than college education, lack of health insurance, a median household income for a family of four of less than $15,000 a year, a high prevalence of unemployment, and no internet use in the last 30 days. And so the other thing that she noted is that these low resource areas are also located in the southeastern United States, shown here uh, in the lower graph. And so we know that organ supply, as well as social determinants of health, which feed end-stage disease, um, that end-stage disease burden impacts our organ supply, both in terms of deceased donation and living donation. It also impacts demand, right? So where there is a disease burden, not only do you have fewer organs available for transplant, but you have more people who need an organ for transplant. And we know that end-stage kidney disease is much greater among minorities. Um, and this graphic is showing you age and sex-adjusted kidney failure incidence rate. And the blue line is looking at African Americans compared to the red line, which are white Americans. And it's also showing you Native Americans in yellow uh, and Asians in um, green. So you can see that African Americans are disproportionately impacted by end-stage kidney disease. So then what are we going to do about this? So I told you that if you really want to understand supply and demand, you have to understand disease burden. It impacts our supply. It impacts our demand. And so how do we fix that? Well, we really only have two options. One is deceased donor kidney transplantation, and the other is living donor transplantation. So how do we go about addressing this? Let's start with deceased donor kidney transplantation. So what are our options? Well, I think if you sort of put this in the context of, a, of sort of a Thanksgiving meal, if you will. I think the first thing that we have to do is ensure that there is a meal at every seat. So we need a kidney sitting in front of every one of these chairs so that every person who needs a kidney has one available. But then we also have to back it up and make sure that we maintain e equity in access to those seats. If we want to ensure that there is a meal at every seat, our first goal has to be to increase supply. And this is work that many of you may be familiar with, um, but it was certainly part of our journey at UAB. And these are two of my colleagues and really close friends, uh, Dr. Peter Stock, who's just up the road from you all at UCSF, and Dr. Elmi Muller, who is uh, a surgeon in Cape Town, but just became uh, the dean uh, at Stellenbosch University. Um, but they were the first to sort of talk about what it meant to transplant persons living with HIV. Um, and Elmi was the first person in the world to take organs from HIV-positive deceased donors and transplant them into HIV-positive patients with end-stage kidney disease. And she did that because at the time in Africa, um, and still to this day in South Africa, um, they have limited dialysis chairs, and they actually have tiers of who can be dialyzed and who cannot. And in the lowest tier are patients who are not offered dialysis, and at the time that included individuals with, in, with HIV who had end-stage kidney disease. And this really sort of bothered Elmi. <clears throat> and she wondered, is there a way that she can overcome this? Um, and that is where she had the idea of taking HIV infect, uh, organs from HIV-infected deceased donors and transplanting them. Dr. Stock, as you may be familiar, was the person who ran the first NIH trial here in the United States. I had the opportunity to participate in that and enroll patients in that and transplant them. Uh, during my time at Hopkins, uh, where we studied transplanting HIV-positive individuals, but we used organs from HIV-negative patients. And that's because in 1984, <clears throat> when the National Organ Transplant Act was written in the United States, it made it illegal to actually procure organs from individuals infected with HIV. At the time, it made a lot of sense. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a frog in my throat. <clears throat> at the time, it made a lot of sense. Uh, because we didn't know enough about HIV, and that was really meant to protect the public. But now, fast forward, was that a supply of organs that we were letting go to waste? Because for every HIV-positive organ that we use for an HIV-positive patient, that frees up an HIV-negative organ for someone who's uninfected. Um, and so, really, I call this the road to hope. 
Um, but when I came to, uh, came to UAB, as uh, Mary mentioned, um, we actually didn't have a program uh, to transplant HIV-infected individuals. Um, it was actually one of our contraindications, and that was even using organs that weren't infected with HIV, because at this point, uh, the, uh, the law really hadn't been changed. Um, and I just thought, this is crazy, because if you look at the largest rate of growth in new incident cases of HIV, it's moved from homosexual white men along our coastal areas to heterosexual African-American women in the Deep South. So these were the patients I was taking care of that were being referred, and we weren't offering this life-saving therapy to these individuals. So I began sort of a journey at UAB to be able to make this a reality, and I had to convince my colleagues that this was something that we should change, that we should be willing to offer transplantation to HIV-positive individuals. And so the first thing um, that was said is, well, we don't know about long-term outcomes. The trial that Dr. Stock did, it ended with three years. You don't really know how they're going to do in the long term. So with the help of uh, my colleague and one of our assistant professors now, uh, Dr. Shelton, in our lab, uh, we started looking at this. And the first thing we did was we demonstrated that HIV-positive infected uh, patients have excellent long-term outcomes. And I thought, great, they're going to let me do this. They said, no, that's great. They have great long-term outcomes, but no one has ever really demonstrated a survival benefit. And no one had been able to up to that point because when patients were waitlisted, um, it wasn't actually logged whether or not they had HIV or not. It was meant for a privacy, but without knowing that information, you couldn't actually do a survival benefit analysis. So we were able to do a novel linkage using pharmacy claims data um, and use uh, SRTR data, and we were able to perform a survival benefit analysis, and we demonstrated that not only do they have great long-term outcomes, but they achieve a significant survival benefit. Oh, great, we're going to be able to open our program. Now, the next thing that came up is, well, that's great, but in the trial, they saw really high rates of acute rejection, and we just can't take on that burden that can impact our outcomes. And I said, well, they probably saw high rates of acute rejection because they didn't use lymphocyte-depleting therapy during the trial because we were afraid of over-immunosuppressing an already severely immunosuppressed population. So we studied that as well, and we were able to demonstrate um, that if you use lymphocyte-depleting therapies, you could actually have acute rejection rates that were the, were the same uh, as patients who were uninfected. And again, that wasn't enough, and I got another question. And I said, well, that's great. Now that we switched to lymphocyte-depleting therapy, um, you're going to prevent rejection, but they're all going to get some horrible uh, infection, and they're going to pass away from infections post-transplant. And I said, okay, well, we'll study that as well. So we did another novel linkage, uh, and we demonstrated that actually they, they really don't. They get the same infections that uninfected patients get. The most common infection after a kidney transplant is a urinary tract infection, and as it turns out, that's no different whether you have HIV or you don't. <clears throat> And then the final thing was, well, that's all good, but you know, this whole management of their immunosuppression is really challenging. We're a big kidney transplant center. We just can't have these nuanced approaches to immunosuppression, and managing their tacrolimus is really challenging because it interacts uh, with their prograph, and it's hard to follow their levels. And I said, well, okay, um, we can fix that. And so um, I looked at the impact of protease inhibitor-based uh, therapy and, H and kidney transplantation. And without question, patients left on protease-based inhibitor therapy did worse, probably because of the inability to really maintain good uh, tacrolimus levels. And I said, that's fine. We'll switch everybody to an integrase inhibitor. No problem. We'll work with ID to do that. Um, and integrase inhibitors don't actually interact with our immunosuppressant medications. And I thought, that is great, and uh, it still wasn't enough. And there was one final question that they required us to answer, and that was, that's great, but do all kidneys really work for these folks? Like, how do we know what the optimal combination of donor-recipient matching? And so we did a study um, really outlining what kidneys are going to work best in an HIV uh, cohort. And with that, we were able to finally change our policy locally, and this is the crew, a bunch of us, uh, doing our first HIV-positive uh, patient. Uh, and we were able to begin offering this life-saving therapy for that vulnerable population. Um, not too long after we were able to do that, um, all of the research and lobbying done by many people, and you see Peter there in the picture with President Obama, um, the HIV Organ Policy Equity Act, or the HOPE Act, was signed into law 
And what it did was simply amend the National Organ Transplant Act to make it legal to procure organs from HIV positive infected donors. Um, President Obama was, was very clear with this. He did mandate uh, research on the use of HIV infected disease donors as part of this. Um, and at the time asked uh, the NIH to come up with guidelines for research and to have those in place by 2015. Um, and these uh, would have to be uh, published in the Federal Register. And this uh, started making me really nervous because while I had had lots of experience in training as well as some of my colleagues who had come from other centers and joined faculty, we had just started our program and I was really concerned that UAB would not be able to participate in HIV positive to positive transplant, that we wouldn't meet the criteria. And so we did some work looking at center level experience and kidney transplant outcomes. And as it turns out, really the only thing that matters is actually um, integrase inhibitor therapy. If you can get them on integrase inhibitor therapy, it doesn't interact with your maintenance immunosuppression. It makes them just like any other transplant. The surgical technique is no different. Um, and you just have to remember to, to restart those antiretrovirals post-transplant, and they actually do quite well. And this work um, helped, uh, we were actually invited to participate in helping to shape uh, those research criteria. Um, and um, we were able to uh, uh, actually get our approval to uh, be able to offer HIV positive to positive transplantation at UAB. And ultimately, we're able to do the first such transplant in the Southeast. Um, and uh, this is uh, myself and, and my partner, Dr. Mark Deerhoy, um, who did that case together. Um, but what is really cool is the patient uh, afterwards uh, was quoted uh, to say that the very disease that uh, people had considered a death sentence um, was really uh, the disease that gave him a second chance at life. Um, and he's gone on to finish college uh, and is a teacher and is doing amazingly well. And so I think this um, shows how research really um, intertwines with what we do clinically and how it helps us move things forward for our patients. And while certainly, um, you know, having the HOPE Act uh, hasn't sort of solved our organ shortage, it is and has provided an additional source of organs uh, for our patients. We certainly have a long way to go. Um, but that's one step in the direction of trying to make sure that we have a meal uh, available at every seat uh, for our patients. I think the second thing um, with all of this, I talked about having a meal at every seat, but I also talked about making sure we have equity and access to those uh, seats. Um, and the government has tried to do that through something called the final rule. Uh, and it, it really sort of highlights that given the substantial difference in supply and demand, allocation rules are needed. And the final rule mandates that there can be no disparities in transplantation based on race, gender, or geography. And so really what they are saying is that there must be equity in allocation when you talk about um, uh, policies. So I want to, this is one of my most favorite cartoons, and, and I think it's something that often gets met, missed, particularly in the lay press when you talk about health disparities and the difference between equity and equality. So if you really want to eliminate disparities, we have to be having conversations about equity. So on the left-hand uh, side, you can see that every, all these folks are trying to actually see the game. If we had equality, everyone would get the same box, but you see only two of the three people would be able to see the game. But if you want everybody to be able to see the game, you have to understand that some people are going to need a little bit more than others. And I think that is really important when you start thinking about allocation within the context of transplantation and talking about disease burden and talking about health disparities when we know that, for example, African Americans are disproportionately burdened by end-stage kidney disease. Are we making policies that are, create equity and not equality? So I'll go into that really briefly. So how did we allocate in the uh, US? This is it's way more complicated this, but this is a brief overview. So historically, we had 58 donor service areas. Um, and you can see, for the most part, they roughly looked like a lot of different states. Um, and so the way we did it, um, because organs don't last forever, you first allocate locally within your donor service area. And then if nobody wants it there, it goes regional and then national. So that was how it was originally set up. Uh, and basically, uh, folks said, well, this isn't fair. So let's take my DSA, which was Alabama at the time. Um, folks said, well, well, how come your patient on that side of the line should have more priority than the patient sitting in Georgia? 
Um, how does that work? That seems not to be fair. And so they started looking at this um, and recently passed a new allocation policy in which we moved away from the donor service areas, which they argued are arbitrary lines, um, and we went to concentric circles. Um, and you can see uh, that we now allocate within a 250 nautical mile circle uh, instead, which as everyone in this room can say, is also a completely arbitrary line. Now it's just a circle instead of the state, uh, shape of the state. So I think that's important uh, to talk about. So they did all of this um, by saying uh, DSAs resulted um, in, in, in unequal transplant rates. And really, I think the goal ultimately with our allocation policy is to create a continuous distribution of organs in which we essentially equalize transplant rates across the country. Well, I would argue that transplant rates are a flawed measure of equity, uh, but it is the metric by which disparities have been defined and quantified. So the Organ Procurement and Transplant Network, or the OPTN, defines transplant rates as the number of transplants performed for 100 years of waiting time. So essentially, it's the number of transplants done at a center in a given period of time divided by their waiting list, okay? But I've already told you that the wait list is not a very good reflection of disease burden. Not all the patients who probably should make the list actually make the list. So the wait list can be quite uh, gameable. And so if you're gonna use transplant rate, what is the critical assumption the OPTN is, is making? Well, the first is that wait list size actually reflects the end stage disease burden of the population that you're going to serve. In other words, the vulnerable populations that need transplant the most actually make it to the list, and once listed, actually can be offered kidneys for transplant. But we know that wait lists do not reflect end-stage disease burden. This is just another way of looking at what I already showed you, and this is probably an even easier way to look at it. So if you look at the number of eligible patients per million adult state population, and you look at wait list patients per eligible patients, states that have really high numbers of eligible patients should have wait lists that reflect that. So they should be in that right upper quadrant. So California, good job, you do a great job. You're up there with us at Alabama. But you can see some of the states with the highest disease burdens actually don't have wait lists that actually reflect that disease burden. And then some of the areas with the lowest disease burdens have waiting lists that far exceed the, the disease burden in that area. So again, it makes transplant rate metric a very flawed metric in my opinion. The other thing that they didn't take into account is that access to the wait list doesn't actually mean access to transplant. So this is some great work done by one of our colleagues in the Transplant Institute, Dr. Kumar, one of our transplant nephrologists. And she looked at the social vulnerability index. So the higher the social vulnerability, um, sort of the more disadvantaged or the worse the person's social determinants of health are. And so as SVI increased, she noted that the inactive time on the waiting list increases. So if you are inactive on the waiting list, you, we cannot receive an offer, an organ offer for transplant. So again, another disparity. So if you just use the total wait list size as your denominator to calculate a transplant rate, you're cal calculating a transplant rate that includes patients that yes, are on your waiting list, but when half of them are inactive, those patients cannot actually receive an organ offer for transplant. And because it makes your denominator bigger, it makes your transplant rate artificially look lower. And we have no system of checks and balance in this country to hold transplant centers accountable for what percentage of their waiting list is active versus inactive. So, oh, sorry about that. Um, the other thing that I think is really important is that we know that transplants don't actually go to the sickest. So this is uh, work done by Doug Anderson and Robbie Cannon, both of our transplant surgeons. Dr. Cannon just got his K award funded to look at this. And, and Robbie is really interested in geospatial analytics. Um, and what he did was he created a bivariate cluster map of transplant rates. So he took transplants over the end-stage kidney disease population and compared that to the end-stage kidney disease rate. Um, and he looked at um, the global Morins 1, um, and the negative slope basically suggests that areas with lower than average transplant rates tend to be areas uh, with higher than average end-stage renal disease rates globally. So you look at these clusters. So if you look at um, the cluster that are in the light purple, low, high. So these are areas uh, with 
low transplant rates, but high end-stage uh, renal disease rates. Um, and then you can see the pinker areas are looking at areas with high transplant rates, but low end-stage disease burden rates. So again, you can see that a lot of the transplants are going to areas that don't actually have really high disease burden. And then in areas with really high disease burden, you don't see the same number of transplants. So again, I don't know that, that we're actually taking care of the sickest patients. I would also argue that redefining local will not actually correct this transplant rate variation that we were trying to correct. And this is work done by Drs. McLennan, an epidemiologist in our lab, and Dr. Hanaway, um, our surgical director of our kidney program. Um, and they looked at this. So for context, let's talk about the island of Manhattan, OK? So you see it here uh, blown up here. So in the historical context of how we defined local, the donor service area, you can see it in orange highlighted. So there was the donor service area, there was the island of Manhattan, and the little red balloons are transplant centers within the island of Manhattan. Now we move to a 250 nautical mile circle, so you can see, hopefully the sharks will give us some kidneys, you see what happens on the coastline with these nautical mile circles, but that's now our way we define local, okay? All right. Well, that's not going to fix anything because guess what? Disparities exist between centers within local areas, whether you define it as a DSA or a 250 nautical mile circle. So if you look at the island of Manhattan, there are four transplant centers. As it turns out, when you get off the subway, it matters a lot which direction you walk in. So you walk to the right, you end up at a transplant center that has a transplant rate that's 13.4. You walk to the left, you get a transplant center that has a rate of 5.9. And the center with the lowest transplant rate compared to the center with the highest transplant rate is only three nautical miles apart. So redefining local will not fix the problem because a lot of access to transplant reflects a transplant center's behavior and how aggressive is a transplant center in their willingness to accept organ offers. So if you look at offer acceptance practices, not surprisingly, they vary, very, they vary widely, and that is actually probably what's responsible for that disparity in transplant rates. You can see on the island of Manhattan, it ranges from 0.22 to 4.48. So if you end up at the center with a, an organ offer acceptance ratio of 4.5, you're 4.5 times more likely to get a transplant Whereas if you go to that other center, uh, let me get my math right, you're 78% less likely to receive a transplant just because you went in one direction versus the other when you got off the subway. So again, some of the things we're doing aren't fixing the problem. Um, and this is just another graphic showing you that transplant center level practices um, have the largest impact on the probability of transplant, not our allocation. So if we want to ensure equity in access, uh, uh, to transplantation and access to the waiting list, we've got to do more uh, to examine our transplant center level practices. Um, I think fortunately, um, the OPTN is paying attention to this. Um, they're now out for public comment, a proposal for metrics for a more holistic approach. Uh, and they are now talking about looking at things beyond one year graph survival. And one of the things that they want to look at is organ offer acceptance ratios. So trying to introduce some accountability at the transplant center level. And I think that's really important if we want to ensure equity in access uh, to transplantation. So I've gone through a lot on deceased donation. Let's switch gears for just a minute on living donor kidney transplantation. And can that help us overcome our supply and demand problem? So to set the stage, I already mentioned uh, that minorities um, are, uh, have a higher burden of end-stage kidney disease. Um, they are also less likely to achieve live donor kidney transplantation. The top dark blue line is looking at live donor kidney transplant percent among white Americans compared to the light blue line at the bottom is among black Americans. And you can see there's a very wide gap. And this is some elegant work done by a good friend and colleague at Hopkins, Dr. Purnell, uh, and she uh, published this in JAMA uh, a couple years ago. And she also looked at um, why this might be. And there are individual level factors that are probably responsible for this. Um, and she also uh, demonstrated um, that zip code uh, poverty level uh, explained about 16% of the disparity in live donor kidney transplantation between black and white patients. 
but I think there's more work that needs to be done to really understand if there is a role uh, uh, that social determinants of health may be playing uh, in this uh, decrease in access to live donor kidney transplantation among minority patients. Um, and so this is a, a project that um, uh, Dr. Killian, who's a resident in our um, health services lab, took on. And she really wanted to understand community level factors. Uh, and she wanted to look at the social vulnerability index. And many of you may be familiar with this. Uh, the SVI was created by the CDC actually to identify communities that are most vulnerable so that during natural disasters, they can do a better job of actually getting resources to those areas. Um, and it really has um, four domains, so socioeconomic status, household composition and disability, minority status and language, as well as housing type and transplantation. Um, and we know that higher uh, social vulnerability is associated with comor comorbidities like obesity, and it's also been uh, uh, posited to be a surrogate uh, for social determinants of health. So here's what it looks like in Jefferson County, which is where UAB is in Alabama. And so you can see, so the darker the color in any given domain means the more vulnerable those patients are. Um, and so that kind of gives you a sense of, of sort of how the SVI looks. It's done by census tracts. Um, and so Cosette uh, actually took this at the census tract level. There's a crosswalk file, and she was able to actually link this um, to our national transplant database. Um, and she looked at social vulnerability and probability of live donor kidney transplantation. Um, and this just got published in JAMA Surgery, and she did a great podcast. It just came out literally last week, so I encourage you to listen to that. But what Cosette demonstrated um, was that as social vulnerability increased, the predicted probability of achieving live donor kidney transplantation decreases substantially. And this is something that I've always been worried about in transplant. Are we just transplanting the wealthiest? What are we doing for the most socially vulnerable among us? And what was even more concerning is that when she looked at this by race, independent of social vulnerability, African Americans still achieved live donor kidney transplantation at a significantly lower rate than their white counterparts. So even African Americans who would be considered the least vulnerable actually achieved living kidney donation uh, at a much lower rate than their white counterparts. And why might this be? And, and so this is me, and I'm in no way in the same universe as Michelle Obama, but I would suggest that we probably both fall into the least socially vulnerable categories. And yet these data would suggest that I'm much more likely to be able to identify a living kidney donor and achieve live donor kidney transplantation than Michelle Obama simply because of the difference in the color of our skin. And why might that be? And this is an area of ongoing research um, that our group is very interested in. Um, and uh, I don't have data today to show, um, but we've started some studies looking at things like implicit bias with regard to this as well. But I will share some data um, that we have uh, been involved in over the years trying to understand why is there a difference. Um, and so the first possibility is that we may, people may have difficulty identifying living kidney donors. Um, there are different issues related to the transplant recipient. They may not have a good understanding of transplant process, reluctance to initiate conversations. Uh, for the potential living kidney donors, there could be a mistrust of the medical community, religious and cultural beliefs, and again, lack of knowledge. And so uh, this is something that we started um, my first year on faculty at UAB through some pilot seed funding. And this is work I've done with my colleague, Dr. Q, who's in the School of Health Professions. Um, and we went into the, spent about a year and a half in our local African American community uh, and spent time uh, at local churches. And we started with something called a nominal group technique, uh, which is a very fancy, uh, the qualitative people will kill me for saying this, but it's a very sort of fancy version of a focus group. And we were able to take the data from the nominal group technique and create a cognitive map. And what we ultimately determined is that um, really what the issue was related to was a lack of knowledge, but a lack of knowledge and comfort with the, the donation process, so how to actually navigate the healthcare system. Um, and so through that, we created something called the UAB Living Donor Navigator Program. Our cancer center had introduced navigators about 30 some years ago um, and showed that um, having patient navigators decreased length of stay, readmissions, et cetera. And we thought, well, maybe these types of navigators could actually help our potential donors sort of navigate the actual donation process. And perhaps that would fill that knowledge gap. 
Um, and so we, we split this up into two parts. Um, we had advocacy training where we taught people how to ask someone to be a kidney donor. You can imagine that's actually a really hard thing to do. So having training around that is really important. And then we offered systems training for the potential living kidney donors and taught them how to go through the process. Uh, and we did this with two of our living donor navigators. This is Daji and Beverly, uh, and they helped us launch this program. And as it turned out, our navigator program was actually associated with a sevenfold increase uh, in live, live donor uh, kidney transplantation. It resulted in a ninefold increase in the number of folks screened, and like I said, almost an eightfold increase actually uh, in uh, uh, living donors approved. And this was particularly powerful and impactful for our African American patients. Um, this is Alexis Carter. She's got her MPH with us um, and is now a PhD candidate and hopefully will stick with us and we'll be able to hire her as faculty as well. Um, and Alexis noted something during the study. She said, it's really interesting, Dr. Locke. When I approach people, everybody's really interested and wants to do it. But we have this subset of people who say no. And they keep saying no because they live really far away because Alabama is a very rural state. Um, and when we looked at this, um, you can see in the left graphic, um, the green are all the po patients uh, who agreed to participate, and the gold star is where UAB is listed. And the red dots are all the people who wanted to participate but cited geography or distance as a reason for not participating. And we thought, well, how can we overcome this? This is going to be really critical. I showed you in my earlier work that living kidney donation was much lower in patients who had no internet use in the last 30 days. So that is actually very common in the state of Alabama. So all of these phone apps and everything that people want, our folks don't have smartphones. They get the free government flip phones. But even if they have a smartphone, they don't necessarily have reliable access to the internet, which they rely on because they don't have data plans, OK? So how do you overcome that in a state as rural and as poor as ours? Well, as it turns out, we might not have a public library in every county in our state, but we have a health department in every county. And our um, local government invested in telehealth in all of our county uh, health departments. So we created a unique partnership with our county health departments to begin offering our Living Donor Navigator program uh, through telenavigation, where our patients can actually go to the health department and be able to participate in the classes, and we can touch base with them that way. Um, and this is our pilot study that we just got funded and is underway. Uh, and so I am very hopeful that we're going to be able to show that to be uh, widely accessible, and then hopefully it can be more broadly uh, applied across other areas in the country. So the other th reason we might see disparities uh, in access to living donor kidney transplantation is because there are, in fact, race and sex disparities in sensitization. So what is sensitization? Well, it's when you have HLA antibodies circulating in the blood um, and the potential for a rapid production of HLA antibodies after transplant through an immune memory response. In transplant, we measure this through something called the panel reactive antibody. It's a measure of sensitization. So the higher the PRA, the more sensitized the patient is and the harder it is for us to find a match. So likelihood of transplant, you can just take 100 and subtract the PRA. So if the patient has 100% PRA, they're very unlikely to find a completely compatible transplant. So how are you sensitized? You're sensitized by being exposed to foreign antigen. The three most common ways is transfusion, transplant, or pregnancy. Well, as it turns out, pregnancy is a condition that is unique to the female sex. And so we know that the burden of sensitization differs significantly by sex. This is Dr. Porat. We were able to recruit her from the University of Pennsylvania. She's a transplant surgeon, but also a card-carrying immunologist. And Paige studied this. This is a single center study she did. And you can see that when she looked at men and women at her center, you can see that women had a much higher percentage of having higher CPRAs uh, than their male counterparts. And when she looked at exposure history, you can see that pregnancy, uh, pregnancy alone in red, and then pregnancy plus transfusion in the purple, for women, pregnancy was a large driver of the sensitization that they experienced uh, compared to their male counterparts. And not surprisingly, this translated into disparities in living donor transplantation. When you, uh, they did cross matches and they looked at the number of in, uh, times patients were incompatible with more than one living donor, you can see that women at the center were much more likely to be incompatible with more than one donor compared to their male counterparts. 
And when you looked at why, you can see that CPRA increased exponentially for women, particularly when you began to combine sensitizing events like pregnancy with transfusion as well as transplantation. And when she looked at this, it, 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 when you go to find a living kidney donor, most of us find living kidney donors within our own social network, typically within our own household, a spouse, a child, folks like that tend to come forward. And not surprisingly, women are much more likely to be incompatible with a spousal or an offspring donor. And this probably explains some of their decreased access to transplantation. And so understanding sensitization through pregnancy, I think, is going to be really important if we want to understand how to get around it and how to overcome it. Um, and so we've just launched our vascular composite allograft program at UAB um, that Dr. Port is leading. Uh, and we should be doing our first uterine transplant in the next month. We now have folks listed. And we intend to use this to study the immunology of pregnancy-related sensitization. And I am very hopeful that this is going to help us overcome some of the sex-based disparities uh, related to, to pregnancy-related sensitization. But it goes a step beyond that. So this is Dr. Mushton. She was one of our general surgery residents and just joined our fellowship program. And she spent three years in our health services lab on a T32. And she asked a really interesting question. She said, you know, Dr. Locke, this is really interesting, the whole concept of pregnancy-related sensitization. You know, there's a lot of data to suggest that ethnic minorities are more likely to have more than one pregnancy. And is it possible that as you have more pregnancies, you become more sensitized? So perhaps this disparity disproportionately actually impacts minority women. And this uh, graphic here is just showing you um, the likelihood of having more than one birth uh, based on your race. And what Margot asked was, is there a role for actual incompatible transplantation to perhaps overcome this disparity? And so when I had come to UAB, um, I, we built an incompatible kidney transplant program. And for us, that similar to you all, it includes both kidney pair donation as well as desensitization, which is a process by which we go across the incompatibility. And Margaret said, well, I wonder if the introduction of that has made any difference. And uh, when she looked at the introduction of our uh, incompatible transplant program, uh, she noted a greater than 100% increase in the likelihood of living donor kidney transplantation among minority candidates. And among sensitized minority women, we saw a fourfold increase in the likelihood of live donor kidney transplantation. And I think this is really important, and it suggests that the development and implementation of incompatible transplant programs is really important because it actually can help overcome disparities in access to living donor kidney transplantation, both for women, but in particular, African American women at our center. And this was great work that she was able to publish in the Annals of Surgery and presented at the American Surgical. I also want to highlight this because I think it's uh, before I switch gears, I think it's really also an important lesson for us when we think about our deceased donor allocation per, uh, uh, process in this country. So currently under our new allocation uh, policy, we give priority to the most sensitized patients in this country. So if you have a CPRA of 99% or higher, you get more points than patients who are not. But within that, we give no priority for how you became sensitized. So I just showed you that, that Minority women are disproportionately impacted by sensitization related to pregnancy. And so there's another option. Should we be giving priority? Is that another way to overcome these health disparities and introduce additional equity in access to transplantation? I think it's something that we should talk about. So I'll end on this and talk a little bit about surgery, science, and advocacy, and really hopefully convince you to be both a surgeon and a science. I think advocacy is really important, and I think it is important to leverage popular media. Um, and one of the things I'm really passionate about is increasing live donor kidney transplantation. Um, and I personally think we should have one living donor national registry for paired exchange. Um, and I would love to see the day that every living donor uh, recipient pair came forward and went into a paired exchange program independent of their own compatibility. If we did that, we would facilitate a large number of matches and be able to transplant a ton of people. So I did probably one of the crazier things I've ever done and did a TED talk, which was super hard. Um, but uh, if you want to check that out, it's where I talk about what that would mean for our patients. And I just told you that paired exchange is part of an incompatible pro program, and it can actually reduce and mitigate disparities. Think about what we could accomplish if we did that. But what was really important by doing that TED Talk 
Um, I met um, our soon-to-be uh, mayor. He's there in the light uh, blue uh, um, uh, suit there, uh, Randall Woodfin. He was actually doing his TED Talk with me, and we became good friends. And one of the things that, um, that is a real hindrance for becoming a living kidney donor is most, pay most people don't get paid time off. Um, and so we worked with the city of Birmingham, um, and uh, he was instrumental in helping us uh, approve paid time off for city employees. The gentleman standing next to him is uh, Lieutenant uh, Robert Tillis uh, in our local fire department, and he donated a kidney to his father. Uh, and this uh, really made this possible. And of course, you see our navigators who played a huge role in that. And so I think advocacy also, uh, leveraging government relations is really important. Um, when Obama was in the White House, he was very interested in increasing living donation, and they picked up on our Navigator program, um, and so we were able to help uh, support White House efforts to increase uh, live donor kidney transplantation through that, and I think that has been uh, very helpful. We continue to have great relationships with several of the policymakers from the Obama administration that are now in the Biden administration and are trying to push forward um, good transplant policy. And then finally, I think um, uh, participating in, in how we shape um, equity and how we um, is super important. And so I had the opportunity uh, to speak at the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine on creating a more equitable and fair uh, transplant system. And this has resulted um, in really some great collaborations. And I, I think we'll have the opportunity uh, to uh, be able to present uh, to Congress in the near future and really excited about what we can do to help our patients overcome uh, these disparities. So I'll just summarize and end with a summary and opportunities, but I hope I was able to show to you today that kidney transplantation remains the gold standard for end-stage kidney disease. Um, the disparities in referral for transplant exist. Um, I think the Kidney Health Initiative uh, hopefully will help with this uh, by introducing some system level accountability. But disparities in the wait list are prominent, particularly for women and populations of color. I think in the transplant field, there is really a huge gap. No one's really studied implicit bias, and I think that's a major gap and certainly an area of focus for our group. Um, bariatric surgery, I think, is an innovative way um, that may help play a role in mitigating.